Hello, I'm Don Mitchell. Welcome back to the 2000% Nation, the book that explains how you can contribute to expanding the fruitfulness and improving the effectiveness of God's kingdom by at least 20 times in every nation on earth, especially the nations that you live in and the ones you visit. And today we'll be talking about a particular application of that as we look at chapter 14, which is entitled Practices that Citizens and Long-Term Residents Can Use to Contribute More. And as always, I'd like to begin by quoting from the Bible, in this case, Book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 17 through 21, in the New King James Version. Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who will so walk, as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Citizens and long-term residents have potential advantages in making godly contributions to a nation's fruitfulness that most visitors, the subject of chapter 13, cannot hope to match, no matter how well-intentioned and energetic. Compared to visitors, possible advantages include more time to study what the Bible has to say on a subject before acting, greater opportunities to experiment with other Christians in that nation, potential to engage with more churches and Christian ministries, opportunity to gain the support of more prayers from local people, making more prayers for guidance before acting, longer contact with and more knowledge concerning a nation's language, culture, and practices, greater experience with acting fruitfully and harmfully there, connections to more people who reside there, a local reputation that makes it easier to build trust and to gain cooperation, possible credibility for prior fruitful actions already taken there, greater flexibility to select more favorable times to take actions, more ways and times to gather information about, to measure, to evaluate choices for, to decide on, and to improve on any potential actions that could or are taken. Access to more local advisors, visibly with local people while the action continues, longer-term leadership connections, ability to attract more influencers to support an action, greater opportunities to engage other people, more possibilities for demonstrating the superiority of an approach, continuing ability to participate in the nation's political process. It's not enough just to have more potential advantages than many visitors for improving the nation's truthfulness, a citizen or long-term resident must actively and effectively employ any advantages. The results will be primarily measured by God in terms of the impacts on other people in the nation. In this chapter, three practices are addressed for how citizens and long-term residents can improve the fruitfulness of their impacts on others. First, assess personal impact on the nation's fruitfulness. Second, become a greater contributor to fruitfulness. Three, encourage those who are trying to become greater contributors. We begin with how a citizen or long-term resident can assess his or her personal impact on a nation's fruitfulness. And here I'd like to quote from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Test all things. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. In chapter 1, we looked at how God measures the nation's fruitfulness, as well as the imperfect measures that a nation can use to approximate and understand the same fruitfulness. In this section, we examine how individuals can assess their own impacts on a nation in terms of the same fruitfulness dimensions. Let's begin with spiritual fruitfulness. Christians can ask those they meet whether they have repented, have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and are following him. Since the answers will change from time to time, it's good to check routinely. By knowing the salvation status of more people, potential for spiritual fruitfulness increases in terms of witnessing where that's needed, supporting sanctification where that's appropriate, 
and providing prayers and encouragement for a saved person who is in spiritual turmoil or battle. While checking a spiritual status, Christians can also ask these individuals for information about how well they, the inquiring Christians, are providing them the questions with spiritual support. Christians can also ask their pastors, their churches, evangelists, and witnessing teachers to assess how well they, the inquiring Christians, are applying the Bible while sharing the gospel with unsaved people. Such assessments can be done through conversations, role-playing, and written tests. Requests for improvement suggestions should be made by the inquiring Christians. From time to time, Christians who have also been teaching others to share the gospel should check on how well those learning to teach individuals are applying the Bible while witnessing. The teaching Christians should suggest improvements to their learning Christian witnesses. In terms of moral acts, as those described in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, that are inspired by the Holy Spirit, each Christian should keep track of what her or his acts are and how often they occur. Recording moral acts will help encourage more frequently taking these actions. At the same time, the immoral acts described in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, should also be tracked for what his or her acts are and how often they occur. Such recordings should be used to encourage setting matters right with those who have been harmed, speeding repentance, asking God for forgiveness, and seeking help to avoid future temptations. In terms of health, Christians should consider how well the condition of their bodies allows them to fulfill their callings from God. Given that each individual's callings are different, assessing the adequacy of health has to be adapted to each Christian's callings, opportunities for service, and any associated needs for bodily functioning. As encouragement to improve, it's also helpful to keep track of how long necessary aspects of good health are maintained for fulfilling each and every calling from God. A parallel review should be taken on how a Christian's emotional state enables fulfilling his callings on her or his life. In addition, a Christian citizen or long-term resident should keep track of how many times his or her emotional encouragement is provided to others on those occasions when someone the Christian has encouraged later reports having taken an action due in part, to having been so encouraged, a note should be made of having promoted emotional fruitfulness in others. In terms of physical fruitfulness, citizens uh, and long-term residents who are Christians should check on whether those around them have the resources needed for a healthy, active life and for engaging in their college from God. Further, those who are met should be asked about the availability of any physical resources needed to draw closer to God such as Bibles, Bible commentaries, and nonfiction materials concerning issues that affect a person's faith and ability to fulfill her or his callings. Next, let's examine how citizens and long-term residents should change and shift activities to become greater direct contributors to a nation's fruitfulness. And here I'd like to quote from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. God often accomplishes his purposes through our actions, both good and bad. His infinite ability to bring good results out of our mistakes and sin doesn't excuse us from learning to behave better. That's how we become more like Christ and able to bring more glory to God. Assessing our personal impact on others and the five fruitfulness measures described in chapter 1 also doesn't mean that we should be satisfied with whatever results we are achieving. If the results look good compared to our past or to what others are doing, instead we should focus on continually improving, always with an eye to making exponential breakthroughs for God's purposes. By simply making and keeping track of the fruitfulness measurements described in the preceding section, a Christian can see where performance is low, where progress is modest, and where acts of the flesh are getting in the way of being more fruitful. Citizens and long-term residents will learn about many of any problems that they are causing and where they are performing below their fruitfulness potential. The next step is to find effective ways to improve. In doing so, start with circumstances where you believe that you know what needs to be done but you aren't yet doing what's required, or aren't doing the right things often enough. In many cases, you can improve through praying, changing focus, shifting how you spend your time, changing where you go, and working with an accountability partner to improve. 
Such methods fail. Seek counsel from Christians who have experience with making whatever changes you need to make. If you have few, if any, ideas about how to improve, you'll definitely need some counsel from more experienced Christians. Where you have a number of ideas but aren't sure of the best ways to improve, try different methods to see how well each one works. If you feel out of touch with God while seeking improvement, there may be fundamental problems in how you're maintaining your relationship with Him. Spend more time in prayer, Bible study, and paying attention to any messages uh, or signs from the Holy Spirit. Your pastor may well be able to advise you on what other changes to make after you describe what you have been doing. Improvement also means seeking how to accomplish more where you appear to be taking good actions that are, in fact, enhancing truthfulness. I make that observation because it's easy to become complacent about those areas where you seem to be doing rather well. Your satisfaction may not be matched by God's impression of how well you are doing compared to what he wants. Someone with more experience in making improvements in the same fruitfulness areas can often provide a more accurate sense of what's possible and describe the more likely ways to go well beyond your current perceptions of what's possible. Although part of your fruitfulness contribution is to encourage others, potential fruitfulness for improving performance in this activity is so huge that it deserves special attention. We take up that opportunity in the chapter's final section. I'd like to quote from Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 38. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. God may have spoken to Moses more than to anyone else who has described the Old Testament. Despite the encouragement of God's continual presence and frequent communications during uh, the 40 years in the desert, Moses was so disobedient that God denied him access to the promised land. Even with his displeasure, God gave Moses one great remaining task, encouraged Joshua and leading the Hebrews to conquer the promised land. Many people who lead fruitful lives for God will tell you that while they communicate quite frequently and in detail to God, the responses they perceive are much less frequent and a lot more succinct. At times when God's answer to prayers is no or not yet, it's easy to become discouraged and to stop trying to be as fruitful as possible. At such times, the enemy who's in the world may also try to sow doubt about a fruitful person's relationship with God. Isn't it wonderful that God has provided us with one another for encouragement at such times? Well, almost everyone agrees that with that sentiment. Some people provide a lot less encouragement to fellow Christians than the encouragement that they themselves would like to receive. In this section, let's consider ways to encourage greater fruitfulness that can help unleash the kind of results that Moses' encouragement of Joshua later provided to the Hebrews during their battles in the Promised Land. Let's start with greeting one another. If Jesus were to walk into the room right now, how would you respond? When someone you don't like very much approaches, what do you do instead? What about when you're thinking about something that's important to you and someone approaches? If you're watching your favorite television program and someone walks in the room, what do you do? I could give you a lot more examples, but I'm sure you get the point. Only on infrequent occasions are you going to give someone your full attention and most encouraging greeting. Let me suggest an experiment. The next few times you encounter people you're not especially close to, focus totally on them and think how fortunate you are that God has provided you with an opportunity to encourage each one to accomplish greater fruitfulness for him. As you greet them with genuine joy and appreciation, watch how their faces and bodies change. You'll have given each one a loving present that will open up both of you to receive more communications from the Holy Spirit. If you keep doing this, you'll enjoy yourself so much that you'll want to keep doing it. In my experience, many times people would like to be enthusiastically greeted by you, but fear a cold reception or are shy. In emotional self-defense, these people may look away from you while still keeping a bit of wariness on you as you, out of the corners of their eyes. Just beam lots of love at them when that happens, and you'll often be rewarded by stopping them in their tracks, causing their bodies to relax, and receive one of the biggest smiles you've ever seen. Unless the other person has something pressing to do then, chances are your warm welcome will lead to a conversation. A lot of people speak a friendly greeting such as, how are you doing, in a way that displays genuine interest. We all hear such greetings so often they don't fully engage us. Contrast that with saying something unexpected such as, I'm so glad to see you, I feel so blessed, and meaning it. 
How would you respond to a greeting like that? I would feel about 40 pounds lighter and 30 years younger. At first, you may not be very good at providing friendly greetings that aren't stock answers you've been hearing and using all your life. You can do better by thinking in advance about who you're likely to see in the next few hours and why it will be a blessing to see them. It might be that you want to praise them for something fruitful that they have done recently, or you may want to thank them for something wonderful they did for you. Keep whatever that subject is in mind so that you can draw on it to say something spontaneous in that regard when you next see the person. Perhaps conversation isn't one of the gifts that God has most abundantly blessed you with. What can you do instead? I find that most people are pleased if you ask permission to pray for them. It's natural then to ask what they would most like to receive prayer for. Then pray aloud right then and there if at all possible, or immediately retire with them to a more private place for that purpose, if that's more appropriate. After you pray for what they have requested, add your own prayers for their fruitfulness in the areas you have praised or wish you had praised and where you believe they, they can be highly fruitful in the future. After such prayers, I always thank people for allowing me to pray for them and tell them how blessed I feel, which is a personal reaction I always experience. At that point, people often mention something else that's going on in their lives. I listen carefully. If I know an encouraging story about someone else's experience in such circumstances, I'll share it. If I don't know one, I'll just jot a note and look for a story in the next day or two. As soon as I find the story, I will share it. If someone displays a desire to learn and a lot of ignorance about fruitfulness subjects that were, there are good resources, I'll make a mental note to obtain one of those resources and either lend it, if it's a library book, for example, or to give it if I have one. In future conversations, I'll steer the discussion to that subject, provide all the encouragement that I can. It's easy to see when people are filled with encouragement because they usually just bound off to start doing something you've just discussed. When people need more encouragement than that, I will mention the possibility of my teaching them and make the opportunity to learn as simple, as easy, and as inexpensive as I can. Such an offer can tip the balance in favor of someone taking on an opportunity she or he has been procrastinating about. If the person feels uncomfortable just receiving my teaching, doesn't have any financial resources to employ, I'll suggest they teach me something or do something for me that builds on their gifts. If someone doesn't take me up on such an offer, it's always clear that my interest in receiving from them was encouraging. Before leaving this subject, let me just mention something that you may not have taken full advantage of. Sitting near those you want to encourage during worship. Like most people, I would sit in the same seat at church or during Bible study for the rest of my life unless I made an effort to change my habits. I pick occasions when it's easy to move around and take the opportunity to continue a conversation prior to worship or a Bible study by following someone to where that person likes to sit. I find that my ability to encourage the person will always be increased by doing so. Here's a final observation. Make yourself available. So it looks as if receiving encouragement is important. Make sure he or she knows how to reach me so that I can help. In almost every communication, I always also ask them to, please let me know how I can help. Although an individual may never take advantage of my offer, it can be very encouraging to know that someone is available to assist should that be needed. In our final chapter, the next one, we look at what Christians need to be doing to expand their abilities to increase a nation's fruitfulness. I look forward to sharing that with you in the next video. For the meantime, may God bless you, your family, and all you do. In the name of Jesus, in the meantime, goodbye for now. God bless you.